You're listening to The Voluntary Life, where you can hear ideas for finding freedom in an unfree world. Visit thevoluntarylife.com to connect with the show and hear all past episodes. Here's your host, Jake. Hi, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. I'm recording this on Mexico's Caribbean coast on a beautiful island and I'm very pleased to have a special guest with me today. Uh, You may remember this guest from a couple of previous episodes, the one on different approaches to uh, investing in financial freedom and the one on uh, investing in gold. Uh, It's a friend of mine, Mike. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey Jake, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. So Mike, I am really interested to talk to you about financial freedom. Um, I think it would be really interesting for people to hear about your experiences because I've talked on the show quite a lot about entrepreneurship and the idea of building up a business and and getting more financial freedom through that route. But the other approach, I think, is one to do more with saving and frugality. And so, you know, I've talked about in the past the view of financial freedom which is really about the freedom to do what you want and in particular the freedom to be able to not work for anyone else if you don't want to you know if you want to have a period of time in your life where you're exploring new things or changing things so I know you have managed to get to a position where looking at financial freedom from that perspective you you know you have the freedom to potentially not work for quite a while now yeah and that is uh I've it took me a while to kind of settle in and realize that, too. Um, but having that ability to be like, hey, you know, I, I, there's a lot of stuff I don't want to do right now, and I have the financial freedom and ability to just focus 100% on what it is I do want to do and, you know, not take orders from anyone, it's a really empowering and freeing feeling to have. And it builds a lot of confidence, too, that, you know, regardless of what happens, you're going to be okay, mm-hmm. you know? If you had to, like, very, very roughly speaking, how long do you think, you know, if you were living frugally, how long do you think you could go? I think I live pretty frugally now, but if if I really wanted to stretch it and, you know, dig in on ramen noodles and that kind of thing, I could go, you know, over a decade if I if I needed to. That's awesome. Uh, I mean, I think that is also highly unusual, yeah. highly unusual to be in that position. So can you give a brief background of how did you get to be in this position? I, I, there was no massive game plan or anything on my behalf. It was pretty much a situation where at the beginning I was motivated by fear. You know, back when I, years ago when I still lived with my parents, I was just like, all right, I need to accumulate as much money as possible because when I move out on my own, who knows what's going to happen? And I had this disaster scenario in my mind that, you know, oh, I don't want to wind up homeless if. You know, I were to lose a job or a couple bad things happen and I didn't have anyone to depend on or rely on. I was totally motivated by fear and not exactly the greatest thing to be motivated by, but it sure as hell was effective at that given point. So I just, I pretty much stockpiled money. I worked and I saved and I didn't spend any money. I wouldn't even go to the vending machine at work to buy a soda, you know, for a dollar. That's, that's how frugal I was. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat outside outside of home where I could, you know, go to the supermarket and buy stuff for cheap. I was, I was doing that ramen noodle type lifestyle, just totally out of fear. Right. And, you know, that wasn't the greatest place to be at that time. And I'm certainly not there now. But looking at it from that mindset, it did enable me to accumulate a large amount of money. Mm-hmm. Now that's a little more balanced because it's, I'm not motivated by fear. I'm motivated by, you know, pr- my priorities of... There are things that I want to do, things that I'm excited and passionate about. I want to have the freedom to do them. So instead of instead of going to that vending machine, um, or not going to that vending machine out of fear, I go, well, if I don't go to that vending machine today or tomorrow or the day after that or three weeks from now, I see where that money adds up and accumulates to the point where all of a sudden that turns into a trip or a vacation or a real unique experience I can have with friends. And to me, that is so much more important than having that, you know, Reese's Pieces or, you know, Three Musketeers bar in the moment. That when I can actually see the tangible goals, the tangible things that I can have if I, you know, sacrifice some immediate preferences, it becomes so much easier to, you know, make sacrifices because they don't, they don't seem like sacrifices. So in the, in the past where it was fear, now it's more, 
my eye is on what I do want and what I'm excited and passionate about. It's so much easier to make those those sacrifices when they don't seem like sacrifices. And in terms of your um, background, you know, for people who are thinking about this themselves, what is your view about going to college and work and these kinds of things? Maybe you could say a bit about your own experience, you know, for other people uh, to, to compare to. Well, college, that's an interesting one to start off on. Um, I was always, you know, my whole family, everyone kind of expected me to go to college. Throughout high school, it was just everyone assumed you go to college because that's, they're, you know, they're beating that into your head for the last four years, you know, college, college, college. And I was always terrified. Again, here's the fear thing. Terrified to go to college, not because, well, because I, A, didn't know what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I'm 18 years old. Uh, no idea. But also, I saw the sheer amount of money that people were, uh, you know, the amount of debt that people were accumulating to go into college, tens and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And I just was just terrified by those gigantic numbers, and I wanted nothing to do with it. Um, so I essentially stalled it out and said, you know, it's like, oh, I'll take a year off, and that year turned into two, which turned into three, which turned into me not going, which was, frankly, the best decision I ever made, because what I would have went for at the time is something I'm not even remotely interested in now. And I, you know, I walked out of high school with no debt, immediately went to the workforce, pretty much, and was able to start earning and saving money. Um, again, not on the foundation of, not on a total healthy foundation. A lot of it was out of fear, saving that money. But I didn't accumulate the massive debt, which so many, I know, I have friends that are in, you know, considerable debt. And it's just, I don't know how I'd feel if I had that hanging over me as something that's just kind of looming in the background that needs to be paid off, that can't be wiped away in any way, shape, or form. It's, you know, I have the other perspective of I have this massive accumulation of of wealth that enables me to do whatever I want for, like I said, maybe the next 10 years if I really wanted to you know, you know, skimp. Um, yeah. So I, I just, I was always terrified of going into debt. And, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, never go to college. Like, it's always a bad idea. But if, unless there's some real 100% tangible reason to go into that amount of debt, regardless of if it's college or buying a property or, or buying whatever, I think you really need to look long and hard in the mirror and decide if that's something you want to do. Because that is a huge, huge life decision that's going to have major implications for years and decades to come. I mean, that's, it's going to change the way you think if you're in that much debt. And that's pretty much why I avoided college. And I was so happy that I did, you know, I, I could always go back now if I wanted to, but that's, you know, that's the last thing I want to do now. So if you're going to make a huge commitment like that, when it comes to any type of accumulation of debt, you know, make sure you go and knowing what you're getting yourself into, because that can really change the dynamic and scope of your life moving forward in a significant way. Yeah. Now, uh, do you attribute the uh, ability that you had with saving to having a particularly special or high-paying job? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, I just had a like a bargain basement, you know, um, entry-level position at a children's hospital. And eventually I moved up. I actually just quit the place. I had worked there for 10 years. And I was making pretty good money by the time I left. Not insane money or anything, but I had good benefits and, you know, a large amount of time off per year. And it was a really comfortable position. And, I, again, I wasn't making a lot of money, but I was able to save a lot of money by just cutting my monthly costs. And it wasn't it wasn't even, like, big stuff. Like, you know, all of a sudden I need to live in a, a shack in the corner of a, a bad area or something. It's like, no, I, a lot of little things like, okay, cell phone. You know, a lot of people have the cell phone plans, and I did for a long time too, but now I just have a prepaid phone. And you know, I spend probably maybe $75 a year to have that cell phone as opposed to 75 plus a month that mm -hmm. most people spend, which you know, you don't really think of it as being a large amount of money in the moment, but over the course of a couple months, over the course of a couple years, this adds up to a ton of money that if you make the right investments with that money instead of spending it on you know, an AT&T cell phone plan... I mean, that, that can have a serious impact on your financial future moving forward. And just a lot of things like that that you can do, little choices, small decisions that you make in the moment that don't even seem like sacrifices can add up over the long haul to, you know, retiring 10 years earlier mm -hmm. than you otherwise would be able to. And I can go into a tons of little tips and tricks. I've accumulated tons of those over the years, but that's pretty much my philosophy on it is just, 
you know, look at little ways that you can save money and things that are going to add up to big deal over the course of, you know, the long term. I think that would be really interesting. And I would like to, to hear more like tips that you think people are useful for people to think about, but maybe a, a, a sort of slightly higher level. You're obviously very conscious about money and about your spending habits. Can you describe how you came to be conscious about money and what it is that you do? You know, do you do you budget? You know, do you have to use any particular tracking tools? You know, what's what's your approach to really being aware of your situation? Well, one of the things that I've been doing for a lot of years is I would meticulously track, almost in a neurotic sense, every expense that I made. I'd enter it into, I used Microsoft Money at the time, which is now defunct. Mm. Um, you can actually get that program for free online through Microsoft um, right now. Um, but I used Microsoft Money, and I just entered, manually entered in every expense that I made. And I could see, you know, how much debt I had versus how much was in my checking account versus how much I had in various investment classes and all that kind of stuff. And every time I had to enter something in, it gave me a, another couple moments just to kind of examine it and be like, oh, dude, you know, did I really want to do that? Was that something? Am I glad that I bought that now looking back at it a day later? Was it an impulse buy? Was it something that I, you know, really needed? And just, you know, a couple of seconds entering that stuff in and tracking it and thinking about it and determining how I felt, you know, 24 hours later or whatnot. It helped me stay really conscious of what I was buying and whether it was worth it to me in the long haul. It's like, yeah, maybe I wanted that uh, that candy bar. You know, not candy bars, like spending a dollar, but, you know, little things like yeah. ordered a video game or ordered a DVD or something like that, you know, minor stuff that, you know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, somewhere in there, you know, that, that, that stuff adds up again over time, adds up to be a big deal. And I just really think about the purchases that I made and was it something that I wanted to make? You know, great. You know, I've, I spent a lot of money on a lot of big purchases that I was totally satisfied with. It's not that spending money is bad, mm. but just making sure that it's in line with your priorities in life and you're consciously spending that money and not just, you know, maybe you had a bad day and you need to go shopping and buy something to make yeah. yourself feel better. That's a surefire way to fall into a trap where you're just going to be more stressed because now you have financial stresses on top of whatever else you're bringing into the equation. Mm -hmm. And I just, it's super important to be conscious of what you're spending and why you're spending it because if you're not, it can, it can go bad pretty quick and then it just racks up and it compounds pretty badly. Yeah, I think that is an incredibly powerful habit, just the, the being conscious and tracking because, as you say, it gives you the opportunity to really think about what you're doing rather than just, oh, my month's, my month's money is gone and I'm not really sure what happened to it, but there it is, it's gone. And then the next month starts and you're working to, you know, you've got payday comes and then you, you're working towards the end of that month again. Well, so not even, not even that. If you have credit cards in the equation too, it becomes real easy to just swipe that card and not think about it. And before right. you know it, you look at the balance and, oh, geez, you know, that's, that's something that's going to be really hard to pay down over the long haul. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm what's your thoughts about budgeting? Because you've talked about tracking, and I think that itself is really, really uh, a very powerful habit. What are your thoughts about budgeting? Yeah, I've never been super hardcore as far as really budgeting and saying I only have like X number of dollars per month to spend in this category. Mm. I've just more focused on every expense that I make and asking myself if I really need it. Right. Uh, there's some people that are going to find a ton of value out of budgeting, and I think that's great. I've just never been one of those people. I just, I look at every single, in Microsoft Money, it shows up as a red expense, yeah. you know, every, every reoccurring expense, you know, yeah. the, the things that you buy one-offs normally aren't going to add up to be much, but reoccurring expenses, even if it's like 10 bucks a month, that's reoccurring. Mm. I always focused on that stuff specifically. And if I could find a way to reduce it, that, that to me was like a, a big objective. And sometimes it got crazy, like the prepaid cell phone I have. The point where I'm spending $75 a year on my cell phone bill. I, I wanted that iPhone. I, I wanted that iPhone very badly, <laughs> but, I, but I didn't need the iPhone. Yeah. And, you know, there's tons of little things that I could do to just uh, cut back. I think that makes a, a ton of sense because if, you know, if, if you're going to do one thing, it makes a lot more sense to do the tracking rather than the budgeting because otherwise people can budget and say, I'm only going to spend X. But if they're not tracking what they're doing... It doesn't really mean anything anyway, so it's it makes sense to me that the tracking is actually the key thing because in a sense the budgeting sort of happens organically if you are tracking because you, as you say you can focus on things to cut down on and and things to actually take action on but it, the tracking is what keeps you conscious of what you're really doing 
And the budget is only, uh, in a sense, it's just being very conscious about your intention, but the tracking, I think, is the most important. Yeah, to me, the budgeting, in a way, almost puts you on a leash because, you know, there's some, if I did budget, there's going to be some weeks or months that I'm going to completely and totally blow that budget sky high yeah, or completely out of the water because there's something that I want that's important to me. Mm. And that's okay. You know, that's mm. the reason why I save, why I don't spend money on things I don't need to spend money on that aren't important to me. Um, because there's going to be a big purchase such as a month-long vacation in Mexico or something of the sort um, yeah. that, you know, it's like, yeah, that's if I was budgeting, yeah, we'd be a bit over budget for, uh, you know, when you take a gigantic trip like the one I'm on now. Mm. But, you know, hey, that's, that's why you save. So budgeting to me, if there's something that you want to buy that's really important to you that is in line with your priorities, I mean... Hey, that's that's why you work. That's why you, yeah. that's why you do all that stuff. I don't think anyone should really, really sacrifice and cut back to the point where they're really depriving themselves of something. And if you look at it just from a budgeting standpoint, it can kind of fall into possibly doing that. Mm. So that, I think that's one of the reasons why I've never been huge on budgeting. But not to discount it, because I think it can be really helpful for some people just to put them in the frame of mind of examining where their money's going. Yeah, so. absolutely. Now, I think a lot of people um, experience a lot of stress and fear about money most for, for for most people the majority i would say is probably more to do with you know they've got debt they've got credit cards they've got to make payments and there's a lot of stress and a lot of uh, anxiety associated with that your experience as you said was more like you know although you mentioned it was like quite a bad place to come from in terms of being very fear-based but it, it gave you a good foundation in that you were more like you wanted to save in the extreme but you you mentioned that you'd got to a point where you kind of overcame that fear based uh, experience, and so you got freedom from that fear to be a point where you you're very frugal, but not doing it out of a position of fear. How did you overcome your fears about money? Well, the first thing I had to sit down and really think about why I was afraid. I think that's you know, whenever there's anything like that that comes up, you have to ask, okay, why why is this coming up? Why do I feel this way? And that led to me examining, you know, a lot of, you know, my early, uh, early experiences around money and how the people around me, including my parents, treated money and, you know, kind of the general anxiety and culture that's around money. Um, and more, you know, again, back to the fear that I had and the disastrous scenario of winding up homeless or, you know, just really examine that. And was that coming from a rational place or was that, you know, why was that there? And I spent a lot of time thinking about that and a lot of time examining, you know, where, where this stuff came from, you know, where this stuff came from in my childhood, where this stuff came from, you know, in, you know, later years as I was working and just seeing the way other people interact with money versus the way that I did. And, you know, I got to the place where, you know, I was certainly saving a lot of money out of fear, which, yeah, okay, I saved a lot of money. That was great. And I feel, I'm glad now that I saved all that money, yeah. even if in the moment it wasn't a particularly happy thing. But, yeah, yeah in, that, in the moment I was not a very happy guy, you know, mm. cutting back and saving all that cash. And, you know, there's the other end of that. There's definitely the other end of that where, you know, you can spend a lot of money and you're happy in the moment. But, but then... You've got to live with the consequences then. you got to live with the consequences, Yeah. So I've kind of settled into a position now where, you know, I'll I'll spend some money. Yeah, I don't mind spending money. I'm not super frugal. Um, But when I can be frugal, yeah, because, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned. Oh, God, I'm I'm breaking into old (laughs) cliches and quotes. But, you know, it's true. It really is. And, you know, I I spend a lot of time examining um, kind of the how money was approached from Mm. the people around me to get to that place where, you know, if, if I want to, you know, buy some nice shiny gadget and I really think about it and it's something that I want and has a tangible use and it's not just, ooh, shiny, I want to keep up with the Joneses, you know, I, I can buy it without mm. feeling stressed out or panicked or, you know, judging myself harshly or like, oh, I shouldn't have bought that. Or, you know, I can be satisfied with my purchase and enjoy mm. my gadget or trinket. But um, yeah, it took a lot of really looking inward and you know, some time with a, a good therapist mm. to figure out exactly what was going into all those aspects from a psychological standpoint around money and, you know, my disaster scenario of like, oh, geez, if I, if I don't save all this money, I could potentially wind up homeless or some horrible mm. thing could happen to me. So I can wholeheartedly recommend delving into self-knowledge and looking inward and just asking those questions. Yeah. You know, why? Why do I feel this way? Why am I doing this? Asking why never seems to be a bad thing. Yeah. It never turns out negative. 
I, I think that is a really interesting because, you know, we're talking about being conscious about money mm-hmm. and, you know, one aspect of it is you talked about how you track everything and you look at where the spending goes. Mm-hmm. That's one aspect of being conscious. But there's also the question of being conscious about what it means to you mm-hmm. and what money, you know, what what money actually signifies for you. And I think for the vast majority of people, money is a really emotional subject and there's loads of stuff attached to it that can really trip you up if you're not conscious about it. So what I'm hearing is that you, you know, you did actually spend quite significant effort in terms of thinking for yourself and working through what that actually meant to you. Yeah. Not only is it applied generally, but in regards to specific purchases too. You know, why was, why I would, you know, why after work I'd stop at McDonald's in the morning and pick up, you know, a couple egg McMuffins or whatever, you know, I was stressed out because of the job I was doing. So right. I needed something to kind of come down from that. And for me, it was food. Right. So I'd have a lot of fast food purchases and stuff. And if I didn't, if I wasn't examining, you know, where this money was going, it probably wouldn't have made that connection as simple as I did. So then I, you know, focused on that and eventually got out of that job, which as of about three weeks ago, I am, I am happily unemployed. Kind of, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but with loads of great projects and, oh, yeah. and new ventures yeah. on the horizon. So, and you, you, you know, and you're in a position where you can do that mm-hmm. because you don't have to be thinking like, oh, I need to be in a job now. I've got to get this, you know. Yeah, I'm not living paycheck to paycheck, which right. is a, a special kind of hell that I can't imagine how people, you know, survive on a day-to-day basis. And I, anyone that's in that position, my heart goes out to you because I know how I mean, when I wasn't in that position, how stressed I felt around money. I can only imagine if, if you are in that position. I just want to say that there is a way out. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I definitely found my way out of that. And it wasn't through, you know, someone, you know, giving me a lot of money or, like, winning the lottery or something like that. It was very methodical decisions over a long period of time that mm-hmm. put me in the position I am now, which is with a significant amount of financial freedom. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. And it took you, what, how many years would you say to get to the position you described where you could go a decade if you wanted to? How long did it take you to get there? I'd say a good five to eight years, right? really. And that was with you know some good luck when it came to investments as well. Yeah. I don't want to say good luck because it was you know, yeah. examining the fundamentals. Um, but you know, Nonetheless, some... I understand. It was also with a, a good headwind in terms of your investments as opposed yeah. to, so not just saving, so to speak. Yeah, yeah exactly. Cool. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are going to be really inspired by hearing your story. And you mentioned that there's many individual things that you that you do. Uh, I think it'd be great to hear some of your thoughts. I just want to reflect back also that I think at a higher level, the budgeting that you talked about is probably one of the most fundamental aspects. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned specific individual things that that you found work for you what do you think are some of the things that people who are inspired by this can think about doing for themselves well i mean number one with a bullet i'd I'd say is just examining where your money's going i mean Mm. first and foremost where your money is going that's you know you can examine how much money you got coming in that's important but you know if there's a hole in the boat and the boat is sinking it doesn't matter how quickly you're you know bailing the water out of the boat it's the boat's still sinking so Mm. you got to address that first and foremost to me that's number one with a bullet and see where these expenses are. Are they necessary while you're spending this money? That's step one. Uh, step two is, you know, how much money are you bringing in? You know, and are you, what options do you have available? Uh, you know, is it, is it a situation where entrepreneurship is something you haven't explored? Why haven't you explored it? Maybe it's a better situation. Maybe you can freelance, uh, depending on what it is you currently do. You know, maybe you can ask your boss for a raise. Maybe, I mean, there's there's tons of options out there that you can explore in regards to how much money is coming in. Mm. Maybe you can look at a couple side projects you can do. I mean, there's, you know, I have a couple little side projects that bring in a little bit of money here or there. They're nothing that I could live on, but it's just little side things that I, yeah. you know, I don't mind doing or enjoy doing that bring a little money here or there. Yeah. And just staying conscious of opportunities around you will give you a lot of options to bring in some extra money that, is nothing that you have to do backbreaking labor or grueling work or that's uncomfortable in any way. It's just you have to be, again, conscious of potential opportunities that are around you. I can, an interesting story I can tell um, around taking advantage of an opportunity that was around me. Um, the hospital that I worked at, our library had tons of medical textbooks. 
And when they get the new editions, they'd, they'd go through and pull out the old editions and they'd look at them and go, oh, this is, this is old information and it isn't particularly relevant anymore. So they wanted to get rid of the books. They weren't terribly interested in you know, making a lot of money from it. They just wanted the books off their hands. So they'd put out a cart with all these books, $1 a piece. So one day I went up, saw the cart, and just pulled it over to one of the computers, popped up Amazon.com, and searched all the books. And mm-hmm. some old medical textbook, these things, there's books that were selling there for a dollar that, you know, on Amazon used were selling for $300. This was just being aware that, oh, look, this you're selling a book? Well, let me see if I can potentially make money on this. Right, right. I ended up buying like 36 books for $36, and I think I walked away with over three grand. And uh, sales wow. just from those books. And that's something I could have walked by and paid no attention to whatsoever. Mm. But just, you know, a little thing like that, you know, it, it adds up. Like, it can yeah. be significant. And you never know. You might find your $36 worth of books that you can turn at three grand. You know, yeah. if you just stay conscious of opportunities that may present themselves around you. Awesome. Awesome. One thing that I think that occurs to me is that a lot of people find it very hard to save. They really do. It's uh, psychologically, mentally, uh, emotionally, they really find it difficult. You know, and you've obviously had the experience of being very focused on savings, and you've seen your friends and other people at work and so forth who don't. Can you, you know, what's your perspective on what is it that people find so hard about saving? What do you think, what are the real barriers that, that, um, that you see people experiencing and any thoughts on, you know, ways to approach them? You know, with me, it was, I was terrified to spend money. I think, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with fear in the other direction as well, with people that if they don't, you know, buy that new gadget or they don't go out to dinner with their friends, like a real kind of peer pressure around, you know, maintaining a certain lifestyle and if not being able to maintain that certain lifestyle around, you know, their friends, that mm. people will view them in a negative fashion or, you know, look down on them or think less of them in some way because of it. I think that can be a real barrier, you know, the keeping mm. up with the Joneses kind of thing, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, that's a really tough trap to fall into. And, I mean, as far as getting out of something like that, if if you have people around you that are going to look down on you and think less of you because, hey, you can't go out to dinner today or you don't have the latest Apple gadget, I don't really think those people are truly your friends. You know, if you examine it and look at it, you know, from first principles in that way. It's, uh, you know, I don't want any people in my life that are going to shun me or look down on me because I'm not able to spend money on the latest gadget toy or go out to dinner or something. That's, and I, I think people fall into that trap a lot of times, and you know, that's, that's really unfortunate. And that's, you know, when your whole social circle is kind of maintaining a certain lifestyle and you feel pressure to live up to that, and if, you know, they're in a potential higher income bracket or whatever, that can, that can be really, really stressful and challenging, so... I think that's definitely a trap people fall into. I think that's a really, really important point. I think that's probably the biggest barrier that people face is yeah. that if you're going to make a big difference between what you earn and what you spend, then you're going to start looking different to the people in your in your earning bracket, and, and you're going to therefore attract some strange attention, or people are going to look at you as as being outside the norm, and that can be very emotionally challenging, as you say, with friends and and family and people who you know, feel peer pressure to keep up a certain lifestyle. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's a really, really important thing to, to, to think about, and it comes back to what you were talking about in terms of being conscious about what the meaning of all the uh, financial aspects are. So let's get down to your <laughs> tips, tips and tricks. tricks yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think you have a lot of credibility about this. So, yeah, what are your thoughts of some, some tips and tricks for people to consider? Well... The first one, which is, I mean, just yielded incredible rewards for me, is the proper use of credit cards. Uh, a lot of people can get into trouble with credit cards, so it's something to be very cautious of. But there's a lot of rewards, travel cards, which give you, you know, airline miles or credit card points that can be converted to airline miles or even cash that, you know, just making general everyday purchases you know, this can add up to significant amounts of money or value over the course of, you know, several months, a year. And there's other ways to double dip into that and increase that amount, you know, tenfold. I I use uh, my Chase Sapphire Preferred card, and I'm traveling now, and I, I forget the exact multiplier, but I think I get, you know, two miles per dollar forever, or two points per dollar for every, uh, you know, travel 
expense accumulated, so the hotel costs, stuff mm-hmm. like that. And there is also tons of uh, credit card sign-up opportunities. You sign up for a credit card, and they give you five thousand or you know fifty thousand points or miles. There's tons of opportunities that come out, and there's various communi- communities that are dedicated to keeping track of this kind of thing. Flyer Talk is one that I recommend. They have all the little tips and tricks on how to utilize credit card reward points. Yeah, Flyer Talk is a community I really recommend for keeping you abreast of all the little tips and tricks and deals that um, will enable you to maximize what you can get out of credit card rewards and you know, frequent flyer programs and that kind of thing. Uh, part of the stuff that they talk about is using online shopping malls um, through the various, you know, like American Airlines or whatever airlines um, that are out there. And just, you know, everyday purchases. If you want to buy something, let's say, at a department store, and, you know, you could just go to that department store and buy it, you know, and pay cash for it, and then you get nothing. You get absolutely nothing other than that item for the cash that you spent. Or you could buy that item online using a rewards credit card, get a certain number of points per dollar spent on that card, while also ordering it online and clicking through an online shopping mall and getting a certain multiplier of, I don't know, four, five, six, ten miles per dollar spent. So at the end of it, now you're walking away, not only do you have the item, um, but you have all these points that you accumulated for just the purchase you would have made anyway. And you can take that and, you know, over the course of however long, that can add up to, you know, round trip tickets to international destinations mm-hmm. and lead to some pretty significant life experiences that you wouldn't have even imagined possible otherwise. I've I think um, well, I, well, you came to visit us yeah. in England without paying for that, oh, didn't yeah. you? Two round trip tickets from uh, New York to London uh, was three hundred dollars taxes and fees. That's all I paid. So one hundred and fifty dollars for each round trip ticket. I I think that's a pretty good deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, the reason that you're able to get these um, these uh, value is because you are very conscious about monitoring your credit card use. And this is obviously the, the, the deals are available because the vast majority of people are not going to be on top of that, right? Yeah. So I think that's an important aspect. Uh, if you're going to go for using credit cards in this way, you've got to have that consciousness and monitoring in place. Oh, yeah. If it's a situation where you're putting stuff in credit cards and not paying it off and paying the interest, all the points that you accrue in the world won't make it worthwhile because you're going to be paying, you know, you're going to be paying so much in interest that it's going to totally negate any benefit from potential travel tickets you could get or whatnot. Um, I, every purchase that I make on a credit card, I pay off. Mm. I, you know, I pay it off at the end of the month in the grace period, and I pay no interest. Then, you know, if you are going to make a big purchase or something, there are zero percent interest credit cards that you could also take advantage of. That that's an option out there. You don't want to get caught in the trap of utilizing that to the point where. All right, it's it's come and due where your zero percent interest balance is going to run out. Now right. you spent beyond your means. Oh, in other yeah, words, now you got you know a, a giant bill that you got to pay off, or you're paying some gigantic interest rate. That you got to be really careful of. But if you if you stay conscious of your credit rating and develop you know and build your credit, you can use credit cards and all the various offers and rewards that are out there to your benefit in a way that can really substantially benefit you. Mm. And, you know, pretty much get the other side of the people that are paying the significant amounts of interest on their cards for everyday purchases, which, oof, quick way to wind up in the poorhouse doing yeah. that. Yeah. That's really, really interesting, really, really helpful. Mm. Cool. Any other thoughts? Well, I mean, one thing, just random things I'll throw out there, there's a lot of, a lot of ways to just save money that people don't even think about. If, you know, if you're going to go out to eat or something... If you take two seconds before you go out, go online and just type the name of the restaurant and coupons, you're amazed what could come up. There's so many just online printout coupons that could save 20% on your meal. And, I mean, this stuff, you know, okay, 20% on a meal, it's not some gigantic amount. But you do this for every time you go out to eat, before you know it, I mean, you're saving significant amounts of money. And you can go on eBay or various other places and buy coupons. Do you always go to a certain restaurant? Is that is there a place you always go to? It's your quick fast food option? Like, I'm a Subway guy. I get a Subway on a regular basis. So I got my Subway card that I buy. Um, there's this website called cardpool.com, and there's, there's other websites like it where you can buy gift cards at a discounted rate. Right. So I forget what, what the Subway card is. I think it's like, um, I think you can buy the cards for uh, 7% off. 
So I'm saving 7% on my purchases right there. Now, if I get coupons, if I buy on eBay or print them out online, now I got coupons on top of it, on top of that 7%. Right. So I'm, you know, I'm saving a lot of money. And then, you know, I can accrue credit card points by buying those gift cards. So I'm still getting my credit card points. And it's just little ways to save money. And, you know, over the course of, again, a long period of time, substantial savings and benefits can accrue. Mm. And do you get a kick out of savings? I mean, like in a sense, like you mentioned that originally it was this question of fear, but do you get a kick out of making the savings now? And now I do. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> if I find some way to like triple stack discounts and savings. It's like almost like I've gamed the system in some yeah. way, shape or form. And, you know, it's, it's fun to do. I mean, I, I enjoy searching for deals and you don't want to fall into a thing where you're spending so much time fixated on this that the amount that you actually get back you're making some type of minimum wage doing but once you there's a bit of a learning curve getting into this stuff with frequent flyer miles and you know various coupon and you know savings websites but once you kind of like get into that and see how things work you become pretty aware of all the opportunities that are out there and then you can just do it as it fits and works for you and you know the the learning curve i think prevents a lot of people from getting into it because it's like oh you know You know, (laughs) credit card reward programs and airline shopping malls and frequent flyer miles and all that stuff. It's kind of confusing at first. Mm. And if you just look at it all at once, you're like, this makes no sense to me. And you just want to close the browser or, you know, throw your hands up and forget about it. Mm. But if you make it through that initial learning curve, it's, it's pretty simple. You'll have an understanding of the opportunities that are available and you can take advantage of them Mm. when it, when, when it benefits you. So awesome. Well, I think that's really, really helpful, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that it's going to give a lot of food for thought for a lot of people. I will say, as with all the financial uh, podcasts... I know nothing of what I'm talking about here. <laughs> just just <laughs> random off the cuff, this stuff works for me, it might not work for you, don't yeah. sue me, something, something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not a financial advisor, and neither am I, and it's not advice, it's just opinion, so... Do your own guys in a room talking. Exactly. Do do your own research and have a think about it yourself. But I think, you know, it's this is a very, very useful thing to think about. So thanks so much, Mike. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, thank you, Jake. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to The Voluntary Life. If you have feedback about the show, please email Jake at thevoluntarylife.com. If you enjoyed this program, please share the podcast with your friends or click the donate button on thevoluntarylife.com.